You can have anything you want at Jonathan's Restaurant. <laughs> Walk right in, it's around the back. <laughs> yeah, I bet it is around the back, eh? Hey, <laughs> you hussy. <laughs> Jonathan, you don't have to put on the red light. But I want to. Hello, and welcome to Adapt Nation, where we do the adaptations from across the nation. I'm your old friend, Owen Adams, and with me is my ancient nemesis, Jonathan Kadat. How are you? Your soul will be mine. Cool. And yeah. today, well, first, how are you, John? Let's be, let's do the small talk. I'm doing okay. You, I'm doing just fine. It's weird, though, that you said <laughs> adaptations from across the nation, but we live in two different nations, so... Shh, they don't know that. Okay. You sound British. You're my lovely British boy. You'll be fine. Hello, governor! Yeah. Hello, Mary Muffins! <laughs> hey, how you doing? Hey, how you doing, John? Let's do some small talk, because we got this other, the whole other existence, the other side of us. You been enjoying that anthem there? We've been we'll playing a little bit of that anthem? Yeah, I've been, I've been enjoying it well enough. The enjoyment is dipping <laughs> um, <laughs> by the minute, I'm not going to lie. But... Oh, interesting. Dipping by the minute. That's uh, yeah. they charge extra for that, don't they? Well, you know, I as you know, I got to the second wall where you had to run around free play. To... Mm. And it's like Corium. okay, you do that once a game, fine. Twice though, it's like all right. Yeah. Screw screw you. The worst is second than the first too. Yeah. Um. All right. So what we're talking about? Uh, we're talking about a movie today on Adapt Nation. That's right. Adaptations from across the nation, uh, which has always been our show name. Shut up. Mm-hmm. Um, well, we should address this. Uh, we you can't prove the. You can't prove the opposite. We used to be called bad adaptations, and it turns out we didn't check that name, or I didn't check that name, and we'd actually stolen it from some people who have their own nice show. If you want to check them out, it's called Bad Adaptations, and um, it's lovely. It's pretty good. Yeah, it's nice. It's a good show. Mm-hmm. Uh, today we're talking about a film I had never seen before. You had never seen before. No. Uh, we're talking about 1969's Alice's Restaurant. Hi, how you doing? I'm Arlo Guthrie, and you've probably listened to or heard about a thing called Alice's Restaurant. Now, as you know, Alice's Restaurant is about some friends of mine, Alice and Ray, who live in a church in Stockbridge, Massachusetts. <laughs> where Alice ran her restaurant. Alice's restaurant is not the name of the restaurant. It was the name of my song about the restaurant. You can get anything you want at Alice's restaurant. And now, it's the name of a movie based on my song about Alice's restaurant. You hit me perversion. What's that funny smell? What funny smell? It's all about that beautiful Thanksgiving dinner, which produced an incredible, amazing pile of garbage, which we tried real hard to dump at the dump. And which we ended up dumping off the side of a road, where we were caught red-handed by some local citizens and eventually confronted by none other than Officer Obi himself. Kid, we found your name on an envelope at the bottom of a half a ton of garbage. I just want to know if you had any information about it. Well, yes, sir, Officer Obi. I cannot tell a lie. I put that envelope under that garbage. You're both under arrest. It's all about the subsequent full-scale police investigation, complete with five police officers, three police cars, one police dog, and 27 8x10 colored glossy photographs with a paragraph on the back of each one used as evidence at the subsequent trial, which resulted in my conviction. A black mark on my record. 
which eventually led me to my problems with the draft. Hey! So I'm inviting all of you to meet me and Alice and Ray and Officer Obi and all kinds of groovy people doing all kinds of groovy things that are all part of the Alice's Restaurant Anti-Massacre movement that you can join by digging this film or by singing the song in four-part harmony with feeling. You can get anything you want at Alice's Restaurant. You can get can get anything you want. House is rester. You can get anything. Arlo Guthrie can get anything he wants. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, we'll, we'll touch on that. So, um, yeah, that's what Arlo did. Um, <clears throat> sorry, I'll stop. I'll stop. I'll stop teasing ahead there. Uh, so, uh, our first question then. Mm-hmm. Jonathan Kadot. Well, why don't you, why don't you explain to the people what our, what our format is for this show? It's a it's a podcast. What? MP3. Ha <laughs> ha. Um. Okay, so we do uh we do adaptations of movies. Sorry, movies that are adapted from other things, and mm-hmm. we uh we we cover films that are that are basically based on other things. So we did uh, a video game last week. We did a book mm-hmm. the first week. We're doing a song today, which is based on the song uh, Alice's Restaurant by Arlo Guthrie. Mm-hmm. And um, we we have usually three questions which we mm-hmm. cover, which is first of all, are you already familiar with the source material before you watch this? Do you think it's a good ad tip adaptation? Uh, do you think it's a good adapt nation? Mm-hmm. Uh, do you think it's a good citizen of the adapt nation? <laughs> uh, uh, do you think it's a good adaptation of the source material? And do you think it's a good movie in its own right? Which is like our meat of the show. That's where we just right. sit and talk about the film. So is that good enough for you? Did I miss anything? Yep, and uh, this Settling. this week will actually be kind of fun because uh, if you check out our Discord, which there should be a link below, uh, you will actually be able to find links to both the movie and the the song. Yeah, though maybe not for long. They're on the yeah. YouTube. We didn't put them yeah. there. Don't worry about us, yeah. governor. But they're there. They're there. It's been there since since before I'd ever heard of it. Mm-hmm. So here we go. First question: Were you familiar with the song "The Alice's Restaurant Massacre" before the movie? Uh, yes, incredibly familiar. <laughs> um, oh, incredibly familiar, eh? Oh wink, yeah, we wink, we nudge, nudge. Say we've, uh, we've we've spent some time together. Jonathan had sex with a song, is what I'm saying. <laughs> or, or as they they continually refer to it in the in the movie, we made it. Um, we made it. Looks <laughs> like we made it. That song's changed for me now. <laughs> uh, no, okay. So let's let's go down. Uh, a little memory lane with Jonathan Kadat. <laughs> okay, uh, hold on, hold on. I'm going to give us a new theme song. Memory lane with Jonathan Kadat. <laughs> ba, 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 Tell us your story. Well, look, just because the song itself is 18 minutes and 20 seconds long doesn't mean that the song about my memories of the song has to be 18 minutes and 20. Uh, no, okay, so my, what I consider my very first concert uh, was actually Arlo Guthrie. Now, 
growing up where I did in Milwaukee, uh, my all the other mom... kids were off to see like Elmo on ice. <laughs> well, okay, so uh, this is kind of part of my upbringing, but I, I grew up in Milwaukee, and every year there was Summerfest. Uh, it's a it's a huge music festival. It doesn't get a lot of like talk, but it's uh-huh. massive. It is huge. Uh, and my mom would take me there quite often, but I don't really consider a lot of those my first concerts because it's not your typical concert right. scene, right? It's, you know, it's a festival. You kind of wander around, you go from song to song, the, the concert to concert, you know, it's, but it's, yeah, I get you. Yeah. Uh, the very first concert where we had tickets and we sat down in an auditorium to watch concert was Arlo Guthrie. I think I was 10. I want to say. Okay. Did he play yeah. Alice's Restaurant? Yes. So that's the funny thing. You fucking this... one? <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> um, maybe. <laughs> uh, he has like four kids. I don't know. Um, but, Are you uh, saying they were conceived on the stage during your first concert? It, it's really messed me up for life. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, uh... So that's the funny thing. By the time I went to go see Arlo Guthrie, he had kind of stopped playing Alice's Restaurant in concerts. And he, rightfully so. Like, the, the song is 18 minutes and 22 seconds long. It's, you know, it's got to be tiring to sing that song every night at a concert. And uh, Just do it like this. Just go, you can get anything you want. At Alice's restaurant, you can't get anything you want. At Alice's restaurant, good night. <laughs> uh, so I, I mean, you, you probably could actually have like a whole set. Just do that one song and then like, all right, have a good one. Just play the movie, right? Ugh. Um, no, <laughs> I, no, I, that's that came out wrong. Um, uh, no, we'll I know exactly what you mean, though. But, uh, so that night, he he gets on stage, he does his whole set, and, and the last song, he goes, well, I don't normally play this song so much anymore, you know, in concerts, uh, but tonight feels fun, so let's just go for it. And he does Alice's Restaurant, and, which, from what I understand of, you know, fans of, of Arlo Guthrie, was a rare occurrence at that point. To, to hear that song live was a pretty rare thing to happen. Um, so I the felt pretty birds, lucky about that. The birds started moving and somewhere, 30 <laughs> miles away, a guy in a floppy hat and a flannel shirt, his ears pricked up. He was like, Arlo? <laughs> in a, Did you? In a, in a muslin embroidered shirt. <laughs> just... <laughs> <laughs> um. So, yeah, uh... Yeah, that's kind of my experience, and my my mom's a big fan of Arlo Guthrie, and so I've heard the song many, many times. Well, she's uh, a woman, isn't she? She would be a big fan of Arlo Guthrie. This, sorry, oh, we'll get into this in a few moments. I've, <laughs> I've learned many things about Arlo Guff- Guthrie for this, for this <laughs> from this movie. <laughs> um, uh, and I've and I've seen him twice since, and each time he has played Alice's Restaurant, so I got this weird. I guess luck when I've seen Arlo Guthrie it's live. Just you. Right? Did his eyes lock with you first every time? <laughs> he knew. He... <laughs> <laughs> it's like someday you'll be doing a <laughs> a podcast, a hit show. Yeah, and I want you to know that I know. <laughs> so I will say I had never heard Alice's Restaurant prior to this. You chose this movie from a list of. Uh, films based on songs on Wikipedia I was reading out. Right. Uh, I'd never heard of it, and I did listen to the song before the film, because I figured, like, t- a 20-minute song, it's not that hard. It's not like reading a novel if you haven't read it before. A right, movie, right. You know? So I listened to it, and um, I like it. I th- it's a th- fun, funny song. It's amusing. It's satirical. It feels very of its era, you know? Oh, yeah. Feels like the kind of thing, obviously not to bring it back folk music to Bob Dylan and stuff, but... <coughs> It, there is some overlap with the kind of thing he does, but it's very much more, um, more I think Woody Guthrie's own style as well, and like mm-hmm. and Pete Seeger, who's in this movie. You know what right. I mean? Uh, we it's, should we should mention that Arlo Guthrie is Woody Guthrie's son. Yes, because that's going to be relevant later on. Mm-hmm. So my only experience to this was I would listen to the song before I watched the movie, 
Uh, and I liked it. I, I thought the song was actually really enjoyable. I mean, it's kind of a gag song, right? Like, it is yeah. satirical, but the joke is he plays this chorus that's about Alice's Restaurant, and then he's supposedly telling you a story about Alice's Restaurant, but he gets caught up in this ridiculous story about an incident where he got arrested for fly tipping, and ultimately it resulted in him not having to go to Vietnam, right? Right. And he keeps sort of intending to come back to the restaurant and never quite gets there, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, I liked it. And the fact that it's 18 minutes long works for what this specific song is, right? All right. So here's another little bit about the song, all right? And I I made a, made a point to tell Owen, like, make sure you listen to the original version, which is 18 minutes and 22 seconds long, uh, because there is another version of the song, right? Um, where it's even longer, but it it's... Arlo Guthrie explaining in song that uh, he learned later on in life that someone had sent his recording of Alice's Restaurant to Richard Nixon <laughs> um, to listen to. And, uh, and he never heard if, if Richard Nixon liked it or not, but there is a famous deleted section of... Of Richard Nixon's wiretap type or taps, which is what he got, you know, in trouble right. for and stuff. And, you know, he was removing parts of his wiretap uh, before he got investigated. And there is a famous one that is exactly 18 minutes long and 22 <laughs> seconds. <laughs> and so the, the presumption is that Richard Nixon listened to the song and then deleted it from his wiretaps. Or, as we've already established, Arlo Guthrie can see into the future. So he saw the redacted sections, saw right. one that was 18 minutes and 22 seconds long with no interruptions, and was like, I'm going to record a song <laughs> with my power of time travel. I will, I will fill this gap and solve this mystery for the world. That's really funny. Yeah. All right, so, the movie. I'm going to do my summary, because I forgot to do it at the beginning. I think that, yeah. that's covered the source material, hasn't it? Sure. Yeah, let's, let's do the summary of the movie. Let's get into this movie. Set in 1965, Arlo Guthrie plays Arlo Guthrie, a young folk singer and son of folk legend Woody Guthrie, who is currently hospitalized with a degenerative illness. That's Woodsy. Woodsy? Woody, not Arlo. Mm. Mm. Arlo is attempting to avoid the draft by attending college, but decides to leave after his rebellious nature rubs the locals the wrong way. He decides to go stay with his friends, Ray and Alice, in an old church that they own, together with Shelley, a drug addict, and his old friend Roger, who's also hiding from the draft. Mm-hmm. Uh, Arlo discovers that Alice has founded a restaurant and records a song mm-hmm. 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 to help promote the business. Meanwhile, Ray decides to invite a huge group of local, local hippies and artists over for Thanksgiving dinner. After the dinner, Arlo and Roger offer to help Alice by driving the garbage out to the dump, but after finding the dump clothes, they decide to fly tip the garbage and drive on. Their crime is discovered because Arlo left a letter addressed to himself on the dump, and they are arrested and fined. Sometime later, Arlo is called up for the draft, but finds himself rejected because of the fly-tipping incident. Uh, after they return to the church sometime later, Arlo and the others discover Shelley's addiction has relapsed. Ray beats him to try and locate a stash, but Shelley leaves on a motorcycle while intoxicated and is killed. Arlo's father, Woody, dies shortly afterwards. Uh, then Ray and Alice decide to have a big hippie wedding... Uh, in the church, where Ray finally admits he's responsible for Shelley's death and says he's going to sell the church. Uh, and uh, that's pretty much it. As Arlo leaves, Alice has sort of stood a little bit a little bit melancholy on the church uh-huh. steps. Um, I deliberately kept this plot summary to the big beats. Right. Because this is one of those movies that is very... Um, it's slightly episodic. It's very broken up into scenes that aren't necessarily connected to a lot of other scenes. It's also... I think calling this film incomprehensible would be a bit of a stretch, but it's not the clearest narrative, I think, personally. Okay, so this this is this is where I need to, like I told Owen before this, I need to flex a little film history here. Um, the director of this film, all right, uh, Arthur Penn. Is it Michael Bay? <laughs> no, the director's name is Arthur Penn. Uh, his most notable work is actually Bonnie and Clyde, which he did... Yeah. Great right film. before Alice's Restaurant. And has some similarities with this film in directing style. Mm-hmm. Now, the reason why I bring that up is because Arthur Penn was a huge proponent of what was called the French New Wave. Right. Uh, Which is all over this film. Yes. 
Uh, French New Wave uh, cinema. I'm gonna French give a real... kissing New Wave. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just tongues everywhere. Um, for no reason. Just, just, just giant around on stilts anthrom- like, um, anthrom- like a Pink Floyd movie. Uh, <laughs> what? Just walking around on stilts like a Pink Floyd movie. Just mm-hmm. giant tongues. Yeah. All falling into a grinder and yeah, just, um, <laughs> that doesn't uh, happen. No, no. Uh, French New Wave. I'm going to give a real, just a real basic rundown of French New Wave is sort of a rejection of classic cinema, uh, narratively and style. It's, um, it. You can almost say it's almost like a precursor to almost like found film movies. It they're shot it's, in almost a documentary sort of way. It's it was very influential over the seventies. Yeah. yeah. Um. Mm-hmm. Here it's a very it's it's it's. I mean, in France, <laughs> it predates this, mm-hmm. but it's it becomes common in the sixties in the this sort of movie to for unusual films or very arty films or very. Mm-hmm. Highbrow films, I guess. At this point, it's starting to trickle down to other films. And in the 70s, what you'll see is, I think, uh, a much better merging of directing style with traditional structure. Right. Uh, so, well, Taxi seeing... Driver is a fantastic example of what would come from movies like this. Yeah. Um, what, what, what Scorsese. Right. What we're looking at here is, this is the emergence of the auteur ship of movies right. where... The director is not being beholden to studio standards, not yeah. being, um, you know, relegated. You know, it's they're they are they have a vision and they're going for it and they're going to do it however they can. Uh, this you know. will be this will actually be the dominant way. Any movie from like the sixties, seventies that people say is great, uh, it'll feel like this until Jaws and Star Wars. Pretty much. Yes. Mm-hmm. So yeah, uh, that that I think will. If you have any sort of familiarity with French New Wave, or if you know, if while listening to this you decide to look it up, which you should, it's it's a fascinating part of film history. Mm-hmm. Uh, that French will, New Wave or this? <laughs> <laughs> yes, go out and French kiss someone, and then watch a movie. <clears throat> uh, but. uh this is uh no knowing a little bit about that will probably make the viewing this a little bit easier. Sure. Yeah. And and it does also negate some of the things where you'll you'll have areas which as a modern audience the the film will seem I don't want to say bad, but it will seem very unusual to a modern sensibility. Mm-hmm. I will say there are some things the French New Wave uh style can't explain. Oh, yeah. I have so <laughs> much to say about this film, John. Hmm. Um, okay, so, uh, before we get into the meat of it then, second question. Is this a good adaptation, a good citizen of the Adapt Nation? In, oh, uh, in I, that, is this a good adaptation of the song Alice's Restaurant Massacre? Uh, well, <laughs> I would say, uh, yeah, it is, because you actually get the entirety of the song played out in, in a section of this movie. I, I would say a section of this movie is a very good adaptation of <laughs> yeah. the song. Um, so, yeah, about the midpoint, right? It's it's the middle section of the movie is straight up all the events of of the song. It's uh, also, I would say, the strongest part of the film. Yeah. Th- so this movie to me, okay, this, this is what I thought when I was watching this. Imagine you were making a movie adaptation of the film Yellow Submarine, which did happen, right? Mm-hmm. But imagine you were watching the Yellow Submarine movie, right? And like an hour at the start was this guy who goes to war and he's like a submarine captain and his submarine gets wrecked and it's really horrible (laughs) and he like loses family. And then the final hour is like him dealing with the PTSD of his time as a submarine captain (laughs) in World War II. And then in the minute, the middle, they just went in the town where I was born, lived a man. (laughs) So so what I I get from this film, and we'll get into more of this in the later section, but... Yes, this is a good adaptation of the song because all the events of the song are in the movie. <laughs> uh, they certainly are. Um, but it goes much further than that, and I, I, 
I mean, I got nothing else to say about it being a good adaptation. It is. It's a good adaptation. Um, in okay. essence. So should we move on to the the, the meat? Sure. Final question. Does this work? <laughs> Does this work as a film in its own right? Uh, yeah. I'm gonna say yes. I'm gonna say okay. yes. It 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 works. And like we mentioned before, like this this is a very specific style of film. And one of the things that going into it, uh. We're not even going into it, but you need to come to terms with very quickly is that the plot of the of the movie isn't so much important as is the characters. I think that's very true. Uh, um, I think okay. I've never seen a movie start so badly that ended so well. Mm-hmm. And I'm not saying it ended well, but it started pretty badly. Yeah. Um, so, <coughs> absolutely. The, the song itself is a quite small part of the film. And the big point of the song, which is, I, I did this fly tipping thing, and it ended up, like, getting me out of Vietnam. So, okay, not well, let's, 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 let's clear movie. something up real quick. When Owen says fly tipping, here in the States, we call that littering. <laughs> okay. Fly tipping here is when you dump something not in a dump. Right. Yeah. And it's, here it's just called littering. Okay. So, <laughs> so that is not the point of this movie at all. If no. anything, the, the, the character in this movie who has a narrative through is the Shelley character, right? The drug addict. Yeah. He gets a beginning, a middle, and an end. When you meet him, he's... Has he just come back from the war, or is he hiding from the draft, too? Um, I, I'm i not sure. They don't really go but, into that. But, but he's working at Alice's restaurant, and he's supposed to be getting clean. And then it turns out he's not clean. Right. And this causes a big argument with Ray. He gets killed. Mm-hmm. I think there's a version of this movie you could make where Arlo Guthrie's not in it, and it's about Shelley. Right. So- actually... So what's interesting about this this movie, I think, is what you get is actually a more okay, more or less you get a, a chunk of time, right, with all these characters, right? You're like you have to imagine that they, they've all had a nice long not even nice long life, but they've all had a life, right? <laughs> and they decided to take this year. And focus directly on this one year in all their lives when this kind of crazy stuff happened. And then distill it down and have it displayed to you from the eyes or the filter of kind of a passive person in the whole thing. So here's why I don't think it works as a film in its own right. Okay. Because I agree with everything you just said, but here's my problem. If that was the movie, it would be fine. But this movie is divided between trying to be that film and trying to communicate to you how awesome Arlo Guthrie is. (laughs) He's he's the bad boy of folk music. Do you really get that impression? I didn't get that impression at all. Oh, absolutely. All I could think when I was watching this movie is, you know that bit in Austin Powers when, uh, like, uh, his old partner says, uh... Women want to want him, and men want to be him. That's what they keep trying to sell Arlo Guthrie in this movie. I and he is, he is not that. <laughs> in, uh, About the only thing he does in this entire movie that isn't completely selfish is decline to have sex with a 14-year-old. Like, that's, mm-hmm. that's the peak of Arlo's... Well, no, like, he also declines to have sex with... The uh, the club owner, and he declines oh, to have sex with Alice. I don't, I don't think the club owner was was selfishness. I don't think that was for her benefit. <laughs> Considering she says, "What? Don't you find me attractive?" And he just goes, "No." <laughs> I think, I, okay, I I think the the big issue with this film for me is first of all the fictional Al- Arlo Guthrie's fucking atrocious as a mm. character. Like he is. The worst. All those things you're supposed to be impressed by, like, oh yeah, he was off having a music lesson and secretly on his headphones, the teacher couldn't tell because of the headphone switchboard contraption. <laughs> he was just off playing some funky folk he wrote himself. Got kicked out of the class. How dare he, you rebel, Arlo Guthrie, <laughs> playing your 
<laughs> playing your bad boy folk music. <laughs> and also, like, he's, he's just rocking away on the piano. What the hell, right? And the teacher's like, yo, oh, you playing that, that devilish folk music? Not like, okay, this is not class material. <laughs> Please don't bring it to class again, Arlo Guthrie. No! Whoa, you be bringing that folk crap in here. That, well, you, that, look at, you have to look hit. at the times, right? Because, okay, if, if, if it was now, right? And now, and some, <laughs> and a teacher caught me playing Alice's Restaurant in class <laughs> when I was supposed like, to be yeah, learning. I made it to this song once. They're up there. <laughs> They'd probably be like, like, okay, well, you know, let's stick to the lesson. Back then, though, folk music was very steeped in anti-war and, and sure. deemed very anti-American. Sure. Uh, but, so, so the... But, first of all, this is now. We watched the film now. We can't separate ourselves from that. Sure. And it's still funny <laughs> that this is a movie about the bad boy of folk. No, okay, all right. I'm gonna... This is where I'm gonna interject here. What you see as him being like the bad boy of folk, right? I viewed it as a character who was surrounded by by these people who never quite bought into everything about what was happening, right? Because you have you have people like Ray who is way into the the idea of you know uh, carefree and we're just gonna do whatever we want and fuck it, we're gonna have a commune and we're gonna we're just all gonna get together and be groovy, man. And Arlo never really gets into it. He's just like, oh, oh sure. no, okay, I'll hang out for a little bit, but now I'm gonna go back and you know do my music thing and whatnot. Uh, he goes to college, you know, because he doesn't want to do the war, obviously. Um, and he doesn't quite fit in there, and he's just you know trying to be like his own he thing. Quite fit, he doesn't quite fit in because he's the bad boy of folk, and he's rocking around to his folk music when he's supposed to be. Like, doing the secret piano lessons. Which, by the way, I realize that's just old technology. It's still really funny when, when he's teaching them on the switchboard and they're all doing different pieces of music. I, just, I think that's really amusing. Um, I wanted to just press one of the switchboards and have it cut to just, like, pawn. You know what I mean? Like, um, but, and then he, like, he leaves because um, some guy in the diner's making fun of his hair, so he throws spaghetti in his face. Mm-hmm. He's the he didn't need to do that. He could have just gone off and ignored him, but he's the bad boy of folk. He gets into fights. No, he's the James no. Dean of he, folk. He was music. clearly he was clearly like surrounded. He wasn't leaving that situation unscathed. What? No, he was they completely surrounded by like three guys, and they were fucking with him right away, and it's like, oh yeah. He's a rebel because he decided to defend himself? Like, but he, well, no. Well, defend himself for what? He could have, like, insulted them back. He didn't. He he got physical with the spaghetti, and then he got beaten up. Oh, well, they got physical Cause first because they were touching folk. his hair. Well, I, no, I get it. I'm not saying he's the one in the wrong of the situation. What I'm saying is, that's the priority of the film. That's the Arlo Guthrie they want to show you. Like, he's too uh, cool for school. He's I... too... I really don't agree with that. Oh, I absolutely do. And then, like, he's surrounded by a groupie, the groupie who wants to sleep with him, but he's like, no, no, I'm not going to have sex with a 14-year-old. Well, thank you, Arlo. You really are a champion among men. But what, you have to listen to what they said before that, where she, like, straight up lists the people that she's already slept with. Uh-huh. Right? So, so clearly that's a thing that's happening. Right? It's a... a, a a downside of the scene, you know, of the free love thing is that, you know, young people were getting abused. You know, and he's just like, eh, no, like, I'm not doing that. It's <laughs> like, that's not All right. I don't All get, right. I don't get this idea of that, that being like a rebellious thing. It was just no, like, I, okay. I, I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is the movie wants you to view Arlo Guthrie as not just because the role he plays in the film among the other characters is one of passivity, is one of, like, the neutral observer, right? Mm-hmm. Salt off. That's his role in the story. But there are so many points in the movie where that takes a backseat to the movie explicitly wanting you to have a very positive opinion of Arlo Guthrie. And 
sometimes that's, oh, look, he's so unconventional, he's rocking around on the piano. And sometimes it's, he fought those guys who thought his hair was dumb. And sometimes it's like, okay, he doesn't do the groupies. All those things are elements of a character that doesn't have a role for that character in this film. And in fact, operates contradictorily when it plays with other people. And what that means is, when you get to... And I get it, it's Arlo Guthrie's song, it's Arlo Guthrie's movie. Put him in the movie, make him like, oh look, isn't this guy great? But it takes... Then you've got all these other characters around him that play roles that don't work in that movie. They work in a different movie without Arlo in. I think. Um, because there are, there are parts of this that really work. The story with Ray and Alice is legitimately interesting. Them mm-hmm. and their beat up old church that they've bought and turned into a home. That's interesting. The restaurant itself, you don't see that much of. That's interesting. And the way Alice and Ray separate because he's not contributing. That's interesting. Mm-hmm. Shelley, that's interesting. Roger, not so interesting. He doesn't really do anything. Yeah, um, he's just there. He's just there. But, okay, and then there's like... Oh, interesting character in real life, though, that guy. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then there's stuff like, um, but then there's, there's Arlo Guthrie and he's always, he's always there, um, being the person who rebels in just the right way against the man or just happens to turn up at just the time when everybody could tell him how much they love him and how great he is. And that's his relationship with everybody else. There's nobody in this film aside from the figures who represent the man, right? Like (laughs) the cops, the The teachers. Well, that's the right. Is there anybody in this movie who, I don't know, thinks Arlo's a dick? Doesn't yeah, like him? The club him? owner. <laughs> no, she, no, she wants to sleep with him until he, he turns her down. Right, and she fucking berates him afterwards. Right, because she didn't get her own way, but she wanted him before she was rejected. And that's it. Everybody wants to sleep with him. Everybody wants to be his best friend. Everybody wants her to write their song or make him famous or all this stuff, right? And talk about what a great guy he is. And and yet his role in the movie is not that of the, the well, the, the you know, hero of folk music. The bad boy of folk music. The bad boy no, hero of folk music. No, stop saying that. <laughs> that is so what they want him to be, the bad boy no, of folk. No, no, okay. Absolutely. So my, here, okay, this is my view on that whole thing. Your incorrect right? view on that. Let's hear it. Okay, my, my absolutely correct uh, interpretation of this. Please disregard the last 15 minutes that this <laughs> lunatic has been talking. Um, what, what you're seeing here is like, okay, everyone wants to sleep with him. Everyone, you know, he's a rebellious thing. What, what I think we're actually seeing here are trappings of the time, right? The idea of free love, right? This is a oh, big thing that. going on, right? So these are, it's not necessarily that they want to sleep with Arlo, right? It's, they want to have sex, Arlo is there, right? And, but he Mm. is not a person who feels in play, like, he feels out of place in all of this, right? So that's why he he continually um, rejects the advances. Uh, He's, when he's on, in Montana, you know, cowboy country, you know, yeah, he gets into altercation with guys who are making fun of him for having long hair. Uh, when he's in school, yeah, he's a, he's a self-taught folk musician. So he's playing folk music in a, in a class that has, you know, is supposed to be teaching classical or whatever they're doing. It's, I don't think we're seeing him going out of his way to be awesome, right? I don't think they're even trying to go out of their way. I think we, we're examining a character who just doesn't fit in. And if Arlo hadn't been there, that would have happened to anyone else. But they might have acted differently. I see what you're saying, but I don't agree. I think we're seeing a character who... I think we're seeing a specific type of not fitting in. They're not fitting in by being the special person. And that's what the movie seems to communicate for the entire first half to me. That this guy is, like, the special guy. He's, He's special. Special Arlo, who always says and does the most interesting thing. And everybody loves him. And he's just rebellious in just the right way. Because it's his movie, you know what I mean? I don't think... I don't think he's a character. I think he's a... I think he's a cartoon uh, of a persona. Other than the song, Arlo has no no part in the writing or the directing of this film. Sure, but... 
it's still an Allo Guthrie movie. Do you know what I mean? I'm not saying it like an Allo Guthrie movie is in like a Spielberg movie. What I mean is, he's the star of this movie, Salt Off. And he, the song is his song, and it's part of his like rising career at that point. Um, to me, this feels much more like this. To me, just feels like the folk music equivalent of that Britney Spears movie. Do you know what I mean? Crossroads. Yeah, basically, this is this is about um, placing that persona on a pedestal, really. Um. And you get some kind of nods to credibility, like when he goes to visit his dad in the hospital. That must have been weird to film, right? Because his dad had died two years before this film came out. Right. And then they get an actor who looks a lot like Woody Guthrie. Yeah. Um, and then they, they try and get him to act like he's actually got Huntington's in bed there, in a hospital bed, and they film around it. Can you imagine how uncomfortable that must have been to do? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Very uncomfortable. Oh. Um those moments are interesting. Um, and I think those moments, it kind of works when mm-hmm. Arlo doesn't really say or do it. Like you don't get any kind of read of how he feels about his dad's illness in this film mm-hmm. at all. Right. Like he does not comment on it. There is actually one of the jokes I like a lot in that, which is when um, it's his first sort of draft application. He's trying to say where he can't do it. And they're saying, you know, what, what illness do you have? Mm-hmm. And he says, it's Huntington's. And she says, what is that? He says, it's genetic. My dad had it. My granddad had it. And he's like, she says, but you don't have it? Well, I could get it. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, um, it's okay. So I, my last thing I will say on this, this argument, and we, we should really move on. But when you say that they, they're putting him on a pedestal, once again, I think this is a well, situation I mean, where we pedestal is the wrong word. Well, I think they are selling the Arlo Guthrie album cover persona in this film. Sure. What I'm going to say is that, now, and this is important, I understand that we're watching it now, right? We're watching it with our sensibilities and modern-day sensibilities, right? Which is but, even funnier, by the way. That, okay. That's the best way to watch this movie. Um, at the time that this was filmed, right, Ray would have been the hero, right? That's the person people wanted to be, right? That That's the, that's the typical cool guy. That's the, like, oh, man, they, like, we're just going to... We're just going to all live together. We're all going to create and be awesome and just music all the time. Hey, you should write a song for Alice's Restaurant. And you're like, that's that's who, at the time, would have been the poster child. That's the... Well, okay, that's- but, okay, but if you made a movie in the 90s, right? Mm-hmm. Nicolas Cage in The Rock might have been your hero. Or Arnold Schwarzenegger might have been your kind of typical hero, mm-hmm. right? But sure. if you were making a movie that was supposed to be like a puff piece for Marilyn Manson... You wouldn't make him like Arnold Schwarzenegger, would you? Mm-hmm. We're still talking about within the audience the movie's intended for. I, okay, I think we're... Okay, well, let's look at it from a different point of view, from a different time period, all right? Let's look at Fight Club, right? Okay. Now, everyone loves in that movie Tyler Durden, right? right. Everyone loves that he's on posters. Everyone's like, oh, fuck yeah, Tyler Durden making soap and shit. Hell yeah. But the movie's actually about the narrator, or the name, yep. the, you know. Who is absolutely not Tyler Dunn. Right. Who, well, yeah. <laughs> but he is. Um, yes. But that's what we have here. Like, Arlo is, in this movie, just not with it. Like, he's not, he's just not yeah. a part of everything. And everyone that's else is. That's not what I think we have here. I see what you're saying. That's not what I think we have. Let me think of a film that I think would work for what I think we have here. T minus 15 seconds to a huge insult to the film. No, no. Well, maybe. Um, well, I need to think of a good example. Um, uh, hmm. Yeah. No, I think what we have here is more like... Um, hmm. Oh, this is tough. I know what I'm. I know the archetype I'm thinking of, and I can't actually think of of a film that would fit it right off the top of my head. Um, because no, I I I absolutely see what you're saying, right? Ray's mm-hmm. like he's the motorcycle race driver. He's cool. He's great. And then Arlo's the one who just doesn't kind of fit in, right? Right. I think what we're looking at is more of a, uh, more of a, an orchestrated doesn't fit in than that. 
um, an image of nonconformity for Persona's sake. A cool not fitting in. And it's hard to explain it. And I know exactly, in my head, I know exactly how it feels to me. And I can't quite think of a good example, a good present day example. Um, I guess the big, the big thing here, right? The big uh, crevice that you and I can't cross right now is I don't really particularly see Arlo as being cool in the movie. No, neither do I. But I think that's what they wanted you to think. So now you're a conspiracy theorist. That's what they want you to think. No, I, I think... The, <laughs> so the way you see it is, I'm reading him as cool, you're not reading him as cool, and you're reading it the way you're supposed to read it, and I'm reading it wrong, because we disagree, right? That's your thing, right? I get it. Whoa, whoa. No, 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 what whoa. I'm saying is, that's when you disagree with someone about interpretation, you think my reading is wrong, right? That's fair. Mm-hmm. I think the other way. I think you are supposed to read him as cool, but it's so hard to see that from the present day that you're misreading it. That's my take. That's the difference we're at. I think this movie is supposed to pitch Arlo as that too cool for school guy, but within a folk music audience, within the hippie culture and that stuff, and within all that stuff of the time. And so I think I am reading it within the context of the time, and I think you're missing the context of the time, but that's because we have a different opinion on it. I think it's supposed to be a sort of a nerd rebellion character a little bit cuz i mean he's a hell of a dweeb mm. um he's he's a dweeby guy i think but he's supposed to be the uh i agree that it's about a guy who doesn't quite fit in he doesn't fit in with these people he doesn't fit in with these people but it's by it's also about a guy who doesn't quite fit in despite the fact that he's basically always right and everybody loves him and that, to me, is incredibly frustrating. Like, to and me, it, it almost feels like this is Saved by the Bell from the, perspe- from the perspective of Screech. Right? <laughs> not, not Zach, the, the cool guy. It's, it's, it's Screech who's looking at this Ooh, and going, what, okay. are, what are y'all doing? <laughs> okay, I agree. I think that's a very good take on what this movie's like, right? But I think it's that, that exact premise. But if the movie was also made by Screech and he thought Screech was awesome. That's what I think this film is. No, I mean, it's fair. Like some, some really cool stuff (laughs) happens to Arlo in this movie. And yeah, he, he's, he is put in plenty of situations where he is given the opportunity to do the right thing. And he usually does. I'm not Um, saying Arlo doesn't read as cool. Because he doesn't. At all. (laughs) I'm just saying, I think the people who made this movie wanted him to. And I think it's the separation of the fact that Arlo Guthrie's not that very famous anymore. It's not 1969 anymore. Folk music is not an up-and-coming revival music form anymore. And hippies aren't the cool rebels who protest the war. I think it makes it harder to see that you were actually supposed to think he was cool, personally. But that's... That's a difference of opinion I don't think we're going to cross. Okay. All right. So long as we just understand that you're wrong. And that's never going to happen because I'm right <laughs> and you're wrong. You can get anything you want except polite agreement. <laughs> um, <laughs> you can get anything you want except a coherent interpretation. Let's <laughs> all right. Let's talk about some nice stuff that's funny about this movie, then, because right, from yeah. a modern <laughs> perspective, this is a pretty hilarious movie, right? Mm-hmm. First of all, can I just say it's it's really bizarre. I know it's not actually what they were going for, but isn't it really funny that scene where he goes to view his dad in the hospital and Pete Seeger's there, and it's Pete fucking Seeger, by the way, actual <laughs> Pete Seeger playing a Pete Seeger song, and he's just stood up in the room and nobody ever talks to him or looks at him or says anything, and it's like he's a weird Pete Seeger ghost just singing a song. <laughs> Loudly at a man in hospital. <laughs> like it was like 3 a.m. when I was watching this movie. <laughs> and that just started happening. I was like, wait, is Pete Seeger playing from like space or something? They do eventually acknowledge him, but a yeah. really long time goes on before anybody talks to him. Arlo doesn't go in and be like, hey, Pete, you know? Right. <laughs> oh. 
the ghost Sega. <laughs> no, and then I mean it, the funny thing is like okay, so much of this movie re- uh, requires some sort of like I don't even say like intimate knowledge of like the of Arlo Guthrie's life or even what he goes through, right. but it requires a little bit of knowledge of like folk music and the hippie movement. And it helps if like, you know who Woody Guthrie is and Pete yeah. Seeger is. Otherwise, that Pete Seeger scene is even more confusing, to be so, honest. So, what I, I do know a little bit about Arlo Guthrie, and he actually spent quite a bit of time like living with Pete Seeger uh, when he moved away first. He, he, he lived with Pete Seeger for a long time. So, like, for Arlo's perspective, it's almost like walking in, like, seeing your uncle. Right. You know, that you've seen ever. It's like, like oh, okay. No, I'm just going to yeah. sit down. No need to acknowledge now, in the movie, maybe there should be some sort of, <laughs> like, a wave or something, you know? But it's just, it's like... so funny. Like, oh, shit, Pete's here again. Just just don't acknowledge him and he'll go away. He'll just- well, I'm fairly sure the movie also never mentions that, like, his dad was also a folk singer or anything like that. Right. So imagine well, you've no, never no, they heard... Do. They, they do, real briefly. The, oh, the okay. club owner mentions that... Uh, Pete used to come through there, or um, not Pete, but Woody would come through there and and play. Fair enough. Oh, and you know what she's singing? <laughs> <laughs> you want something more in common with your old man? <laughs> uh, yeah. So that's that's a weird moment in the film. Oh, when the club owner comes onto him. Oh, oh well, yeah. Oh, the Pete Seeger moment. The, both. <laughs> the, the Pete Seeger moment really made me laugh. Because it was just <laughs> happening. And it, then it didn't stop happening. And then they he gets his guitar out and uh, he starts playing. And this is really funny because Bob Dylan kind of popularized that. Okay, so I'm going to say something. Everybody who knows me knows I'm a huge Bob Dylan fan, right? Mm-hmm. Can I just say about Bob Dylan? He's a shitty harmonica player. Right. Like, he's a really shitty harmonica player. Mm-hmm. And... What he managed to do that I suppose is to be praised. He found a way to make his own shitty harmonica playing sound fairly okay against a guitar, right? Th- mm-hmm. That's fine. But it went on to become a tradition, and like Pete Seeger... Pete Seeger, I believe, is actually on record as not being a fan of Bob Dylan's harmonica playing. Oh, yeah. well, I mean, well, they had the huge falling out at the... Um, right. Uh, the Newport... When he uh, went electric. Festival. Yeah. And Pete Seeger was running around with an axe trying to cut the... The power cable to turn off the amplifier. <laughs> right. Which I found out years later was because um, Pete Seeger's dad was there, and his dad was, like, 90, and <laughs> had, like, like sensitive ears. And then Bob Dylan <laughs> starts coming out with, like, Maggie's Farm. <laughs> Ain't gonna bring no Maggie's Farm no more. Just after, after the previous set was, like, some old woman with a seashell necklace and a, <laughs> and a squeeze box. <laughs> Poor guy probably thought he was back in World War One, you know? <laughs> <laughs> right, when when the Germans came over the trenches with electric guitars <laughs> and harmonicas. Oh, come on. Folk music, a 90-year-old folk music singer's dad. They probably didn't have electricity when he was a kid. Right. It must right. have sounded like a... <laughs> That's, that's still a bit of an extreme reaction, though, to find the axe. <laughs> like... Get the axe! <laughs> <laughs> what I like about that story is Pete Seeger, he built a reputation as being like a gentle giant, right? Because he's a really mm-hmm. tall guy. Yeah. But, like, but he sings all like these soft, beautiful songs. Mm-hmm. And now whenever I fear furnish a song, I just imagine him being like, Get the axe! <laughs> he just has like a, like a weird uh, reaction to any sort of electricity nowadays. Yeah. Like, he just... <laughs> Like, just randomly, like, walking down the like street. Like a Spider-Man like, villain? Like, <laughs> electricity. Folk man? <laughs> it's like, like, it's like Christmas time and someone plugs in, like, a string of, like, lights. It's like, no! The government's putting out PSAs, like, beware that you tie up your cable safely tonight to protect from Pete Seeger. Um, like, a, like a forecaster at Christmas. And uh, Pete Seeger's been spotted in the tri-state area. <laughs> Moving down in a westerly direction, taking out Christmas lights all the way. So wrap up warm, folks, and uh... <laughs> that's like the horror movie opening, where it just shows some some poor electrician, you know, drilling into a wall. Shadow comes behind him. <laughs> Pete Singer, no! <laughs> He's written new part in blood on the sand, <laughs> on the snow, on the sand. <laughs> 
It's happening again. Uh, so Allison's restaurant. Um, yeah. <laughs> I love that moment when she's like, Woody, you should, uh, Woody, sorry, Arlo, you should write a song for us, an advert. <laughs> and then it's like the movie just stops. Like it just freezes. We look Arlo in the voice. I want to, I want to have it like cut to the narrator from the Wonder Years, you know, me? Write a commercial? <laughs> I'd never thought about it before, but Alice was right. <laughs> <laughs> I should write a jingle. <laughs> <laughs> you can get anything you want. And Alice is right. And then, like, it was really weird. The whole movie froze. And then from a little, there was a little film footage of a, a side door and the director walked on. And he walked right to the middle of the screen and he went, Like the song! The <laughs> song that it's based on! <laughs> and then he walked out. He really slowly, like, walked out. He climbed down from a little stepladder. He walked back towards the door. They closed the door again. It was a strange moment. So, it's. It, I think it should be... This is how I'm going to say this, right? You, what I think we got with this movie, right, is... I looked, a, I looked it up a little bit, right? So, um, the director, uh, Arthur Penn, actually lived uh, not too far away from this town where this event actually happened, right? Right, because we should and, say the song is a true story. Yes. Um, and when he got home, for, I think from filming Bonnie and Clyde or whatever. His he, wife was killed after fly tippers threw a load of garbage. <laughs> this has all, this all been an elaborate plot to get Arlo Guthrie in the same room. <laughs> <laughs> no, he never connected the two until about six weeks after he'd finished making the movie. He's like there in the premiere. Halfway Son through, stands up. Oh bitch. shit! I'll kill you, Guthrie. <laughs> <laughs> Give me your long-haired hippie motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> you think you're so cool? You think you're the bad boy of folk? <laughs> you just don't fit in. <laughs> Which is what I was trying to get across. And then everyone else in the audience, like, really? No, we thought he was supposed to be the bad boy of folk. Uh, and then all the reasonable people are all like, "No, he just doesn't really belong no, in the movie." No, what they said, John. They said he was <laughs> killed by the bad boy. <laughs> you weren't. <there. laughs> so yeah, carry on. You uh, live in the uh, same town, eh? Yeah. So what I think what happened was, is he he goes, "Hey, I want to make a movie, right?" And I, what I really want to do is just kind of have a little bit of a, um an exploration into this, you know, uh, East Coast hippie thing, right? Because there, there's a difference between, like, West Coast hippie movement and then the East Coast, right? There there was some some differences, right? Yeah. The coast. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, well, e- East Coast actually had a little bit more of a rougher time. Uh, the state governments and stuff weren't quite as receptive as the West Coast governments were. And, uh, so there was a different different thing, and it, and it wasn't as pretty, right? It wasn't it wasn't people, you know, on Ash um, Ashburn and Hate, you know, with flowers in their hair every day, and you know they're spinning around in circles in in the parks and and whatnot. It was it was a little bit Me and you, and a little you. bit grittier. <laughs> yeah, sorry, you said <laughs> yeah. spinning around in the parks where my brain went. <laughs> together. If you're going to San Francisco, <laughs> remember what the Dormouse said. Song's bullshit. They don't speak English words. Um. <laughs> uh, so I think he's like, okay, I want to do this, but I'm going to use this real life event that happened to kind of. Uh, sell it, right? That, and I think that's what we get, is that he he chooses this event that, you know, close to his hometown, and he knows that the song is a hit, right? It's it, it's a popular song, so he's like, okay, I'm gonna use this to sell it, but this is not the exact movie I want to make, which is why I think the, the actual song bits are not very prominent in the film. It definitely feels like the song is a different movie they were obliged to put in that. Right. Uh, so we, we should actually get to that part of the film. Uh, can, I, can I just say one thing while we're on the subject of real life connections that I want to say and then I'll let you run with it? Sure. 
Um, I did like, because I also did a little bit of research, um, the police chief who arrests Arlo Guthrie, he's, oh, he's played that- by the real police chief who arrested Arlo Guthrie. <laughs> right. He played himself. Well, like a good portion of the, the cast in that film are residents of the town. Absolutely. Yeah. But what I also found out is he was also the model for that Norman Rockwell painting where a police chief's looking over at a little runaway boy at a diner counter. Mm-hmm. It's the same guy. Um, wow. <laughs> I, well done. Oh, no. No, well, not that one. Sorry, I'm looking up here, actually. It was not that one. It's the one where there's the two boys by the fire hydrant. Okay. But yeah, he was he was in the Rockwell painting. Hmm. He had a yeah. prolific career as not a police officer. <laughs> um. But yeah, carry on. So yeah. So okay, we we get to we get to the incident, the massacre, right? The, and as Owen said in his summary, what what it comes down to is they have a big Thanksgiving dinner, a Thanksgiving dinner that can't be beat, and. Afterwards, you know, all the all the hippies and freeloaders and stuff. I, I say that disparagingly. I kind of have a sort of uh, secret love for those those hippies back in the day. Eh, their uh, era's over. Fuck them. <laughs> Freeloading sons of bitches. Relics of the past. Lefty, whingy liberals. <coughs> Cut your hair. <laughs> Get a job. <laughs> Long-haired, freaky people don't apply. Um. <laughs> You're not the bad boy folk. <laughs> you just don't fit in. <laughs> uh, but they they basically trash trash the church where everyone's staying, and so like in the summary, Owen or Owen says is Arlo and his buddy they get the garbage and they throw it throw it away, right? Um, which kicks off, I think. I mean, is the the comedic highlight of the film? Sure, right? and my favorite joke in the whole movie. When he says, can you explain how that lot of letter got there? <laughs> it's like, and he's I like, can... I cannot tell a lie. I placed it underneath the, the trash. <laughs> um, but there's just like, <laughs> my favorite part is like, when they go back to the crime scene. Uh, and, it's, and it's just a, a throng of police officers just. Like going they way like some over... of the best equipment in the county, <laughs> right? And the funny thing is, like, what makes that so funny to me is, like, I I live in a pretty small area now, and you kind of see that same thing happen here, where, uh, it, you know, there's a there's a decent sized police force here, and there's you know, the county sheriffs are are based here, and and uh, but whenever there's like a big crime, like they pull out. All the stops. They have like an armored vehicle present. They have dogs running around. They have they have whole blocks taped off. They have evacuated everyone in the area. And it's just it's like way over the top, right? It's like like when you see like in like Law and Order when there's a murder, there's like three cops standing around, like taking some pictures and whatnot, mm. and they they have a little area closed off. Like okay. Here, when something like that happens, it is like the whole town shuts down. Like, uh, so I kind of relate to that when you know a small town, and granted, it's litter, but they've decided that this is the crime of the century. And oh my god, I thought that was hilarious. Oh man, I just remember that weird scene with the faith healer. Oh yeah. Yep. Sort of comes out of nowhere, doesn't it? Mm-hmm. <laughs> that voice, man. Uh. Jesus! <laughs> and you want to be work for the Lord, and you want to be saved by the Lord, you want to be judged in heaven, and you want to... It almost sounds like an auctioneer. Right. Oh, one dollar, one dollar, man! <laughs> <laughs> I got this pristine soul up here. Do you want this soul? you want to go spinning starts at five dollars? Five dollars, do I hear five dollars? Five dollars, or the five twenty-five? Five twenty-five? Five twenty-five? But... <laughs> So then, do you know which scene I do like? Even though it belongs in a totally different movie. Sure. The scene where he actually goes to have his draft assessment feels like it's from like <laughs> a, a move, a, like a Who movie. Do you know what I mean? Like a like a like a movie by the Who, like like a Quadrophenia or a Tommy right. or you know. It's such a weird, surreal musical scene. Yeah, I mean, it's like it's it's, a, it's almost avant garde in a way. A hilarious like, comedic scene that repeatedly uses the phrase "father rapers." 
<laughs> and mother stabbers. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's like it's like this weird interlude where. Oh, it's like okay, so we we get a whole movie where everything is kind of. I mean, nothing seems like really out of place, right? It seems like a pretty straightforward movie. I mean, it's filmed in a kind of weird way, and uh, it takes some getting used to seeing like that. But it's for all intents and purposes a pretty normal movie. And then we get this middle section, which sort of highlights the absurdity of the actual real life uh, right. event by making this scene incredibly absurd and already a strange movie. I mean, it's... It's sort of great. <laughs> <laughs> sort of awful at the same time. Which kind of yeah. sums up the whole film, really. My, I think my favorite bit is... Uh, uh, <laughs> he has to do a, a a urine test. Right. So they have this whole section where people are standing in line holding glass jars of piss. And they're setting it down. And he comes in and he just has a little bit at the bottom. And they're like, that's not enough. It was what I got. Well, it's not enough. Go back in there and fill up some more. <laughs> and he walks in and sees everyone doing it. He's like, anyone got any to spare? <laughs> I quite like it's. It's such a little joke. But when uh, they're having like the testicular exam, you know. <laughs> turn your hat. Turn your, turn your hat and cough. <laughs> it was good. I thought that. Yeah. I thought the whole funny thing is that as soon as he gets in there, <laughs> the rest of that whole scene, everyone's in their underwear. <laughs> like, it's a, it's a really, like, small thing. Because, like, it would never actually go down that way. They they would, you know, they'd clearly they'd strip down for the, the physical part of it, but then they would probably get dressed up again. Right. Um, in this, in this, in the, fo- in the movie, they strip down for the physical, but then no one ever puts their clothes back on. So you have these moments, everyone's sitting on this bench waiting to, you know, talk to a recruiter or whatever, and everyone's just in their underwear. Uh, he's talking to the psychologist in his underwear. Uh, no, it's just, it's very, very strange. Um, the whole movie's very strange. <laughs> yeah. It's, I mean, it's, it's not just strange in a 1960s way, because I've seen a lot of movies from the 60s, right? Mm-hmm. It's strange in a very specific way that I think you only get because this is not just a movie from 1969, but it's a movie from 1969 about hippie culture and about music culture Mm -hmm. and about these specific people. Right. And sometimes it's very pretentious. And can I just say, most of the people in this film are fucking awful. Yeah. (laughs) Not many of them are likable. Mm -hmm. Uh, But then there's really weird things like, Every time you see Roger, he's like soft lit like he just came down from heaven. And I don't really know what the movie wants you to think about him. Because he does nothing in the film except smoke weed. But you know what I mean? Like, the first few times you see him, it's like, ah, Roger. He's always like staring right at the camera. Uh, well, it should be known that that was his one and only movie role. Uh, I, look, I looked him up. Um and then, but like, I, I think, Alice I think a does lot of nothing it... really except leave Ray and then go back to Ray. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, I, I think, I think this goes back to what I said before: is that I think a lot of this movie can kind of be explained away uh, under the premise that this is most of this is from Arlo's perspective, right? So, right. It's it, you kind of run to the situation of like, okay. Did this actually happen this way, or is this how Arlo's perceiving it? Um, right. In all probability, the club owner didn't come on to him at all, <laughs> and the and the group is like, "Get out! I'm changing. Like, go away." <laughs> right. You're uh, not the bad boy of folk. Oh, you just you just don't fit in. <laughs> um, <laughs> He's uh, like, well, you are fourteen. So let's talk about that scene, right? Oh, it's do you, I I text you as soon as I got to it, and I knew that's the scene you're talking about too, like because I watched it later, and when I saw that scene, I'm like, that's what he was talking about. <laughs> and I just said, well, this just got incredibly awkward, and it is. It's a very yeah. awkward, uncomfortable scene. Um, I, I did think it's check. supposed to be. Oh sure, I mean, mm. I I did check. She is not 14. Thank God. Right. I yeah. didn't think the movie would be on YouTube if she was. Right, right. Um, I mean, you could tell anyway, because she's doing, like, the worst attempt at, like, a teenager's voice. Right. 
but it's really terrible. So he's he's in the club playing his shitty mm-hmm. music. Um, I the Alice's Restaurant song I like. Every other song he plays in the film is very forgettable. Yeah. Um, and she leads him away, and she takes him into a back room and starts taking her clothes off. And as soon as she's naked, he's like, "How old are you?" It's not quite the way he says it, but I like to imagine that's what he was thinking. You know, mm-hmm. are you a cop? Uh, <laughs> This is a sting. This is a sting operation. <laughs> do you know what? Uh, do you know one of those thirty other girls? Um, and uh, and she says, "I'm 17. And he's like, "Come on!" She's like, "All right, I'm 15. Come on!" So she finally reveals she's 14, and mm-hmm. she's going. She's a groupie. She's going from musician to musician. This mm-hmm. is one of I think the bit the best examples of this movie thinking Arlo's so cool. She doesn't want to sleep with him because she's famous. She wants to sleep with him because she's pretty sure he's gonna get an album. Right. Like she's she's pre groupying. Um <laughs> She's she's getting in line. Uh, right, right. She's getting there up the front in case the she, She's pre ordering. It's like buying uh, Anthem. It's not good yet, <laughs> but if, in a year or so, uh it it's folk music as service. Um <laughs> and I mean he declines because mm-hmm. I, I assume it's because she's 14. That, that seems to be why. Thinks mm-hmm. that's a bad thing. Um, g- good on you, Arlo. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it's a weird scene, right? Oh yeah, yeah. It's, it, it's it's specifically I think it doesn't help that this is the one scene where there's like nudity. Right. You could have done it. She's <laughs> the only underage girl in the whole movie, as far as I know, mm-hmm. and. She's naked. Yeah. And I, and I sort of feel like you could have just not done that. <laughs> could, could have just had to sort of like start to undress, right? Mm-hmm. And he goes, no, please don't take your clothes off. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I, I think this is... Once again, I, I, this is at least my theory where the movie is primarily about him just not fitting in is like... He's there, right? Like, he has a naked person in front of him who desperately wants to sleep with him, and he's just not into it. Like, and and Don't and then she goes, she actually she lists she lists the, the other people that she sl- that she slept with. Like, like she she makes it clear, like, oh yeah, most musicians who come into this room will sleep with me. What I want to know is. Right. Um, are they the names of real musicians? Because I don't remember. And can we go look them up? <laughs> <laughs> I don't that, want to. Do uh, you think they're on Twitter? <laughs> <laughs> There's some, some pricks on the back of their neck like, oh shit, someone's finally talking about this movie again. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> In the 80s, gonna... we could still just about get away with it. <laughs> um... So and we we see this again, right? This the sort of motif of of um, Arlo doesn't want to just have sex with people for the sake of having sex. Because there's another scene that happens, and it happens later on where so the this the series of events is uh, Ray and Alice kind of have a falling out. They they get they get into a little bit of a fight. And then Alice actually sleeps with Shelly, the drug dealer, which is the one of the like I, I can't look at an air hose again the same way, uh, uh-huh. because that was a strange love making scene. Yeah, it, with the with the air hose. Like, this is this is the scene I <laughs> I I sent you another message. <laughs> Do you remember? I uh, I don't. Let me let me pull this up. I think I sent you another message. Maybe afterwards. So, <laughs> um, let me find this. So, I like. I seem to remember running to tell you about this. Well, and, and I'm desperate. <coughs> this might have been when I asked you if you'd watched it yet, mm-hmm. and that's when you told me you hadn't seen it before. I think. Oh okay. damn it! I can't find it. So, um, yeah, um. This scene made the movie for me. Prior to this scene, I was worried we wouldn't have enough to talk about. And until you mentioned it, I'd forgotten. And I'm glad you reminded me. Hey. 
What's that air hose for? Why have they got it? Why, why, why do they have it at that present moment in time? They're not in a garage. Yes, what they, they are. <laughs> Pardon? They are. Are they in a garage? Okay, yeah. they're in a garage. It was late. Yeah, he was cleaning. He was cleaning his motorcycle. Okay, and that's not a euphemism. <laughs> they start. They start getting together. Shelley and uh, they're about to make it. Thingy, they're about to do it to make it. Uh, <laughs> mm-hmm. And then he's got an air hose, and she's wearing like a light dress. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I, th- what, what I think it is is kind of funny. <laughs> <laughs> it's a really awkward scene. But what, what makes it awkward is that... It gets better, though. So, she's got this light dress on. It's like a flowing, sort of semi-transparent thing, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he's holding the air for a hose. And he's like, well, it gets stuff off motorcycles. <laughs> I'll just point it at her, and I'll give her a little bit of, like, a, like, a, like a hose down with air. <laughs> So he, and it comes out of nowhere, this scene, by the way. <laughs> so he's like, Psh, you know. And that's funny enough, right? Mm. He's just attacking her with the air hose. Like. <laughs> but then it, like, cuts away. And then it comes back to them. And they're properly going at it, right? <laughs> but they've still got the air hose. <laughs> they're just spraying at each other with it. <laughs> it's fucking weird. <laughs> Hippies. <laughs> I refuse to believe that the audience watching that in 1969 went, oh yeah, done that. <laughs> uh, yeah, the, old, <laughs> the old Massachusetts air hose. Yep, done. <laughs> <laughs> done that one. <laughs> the old blowy Sanchez. It's <laughs> kind of funny. Like, I don't know if it was the actress herself or like the character of Alice. But you can tell that she is not having it. Like, she's just like, for fuck's <laughs> sakes. Like, like quit, quit blowing this thing in my face. Like, please. <laughs> please. <laughs> uh. um, what made it funny for me is before he turns the hose on her, right? He, he, he does it to himself. So, so they have this, like, real, real deep heart to heart where they decide that they're going to have sex. And his hair's just sticking straight up. Like. He, <laughs> like, he just put his fucking finger into a light socket. Like. What's amazing is, I also researched this as well, and like, Alice was a real person. Mm hmm. And then I read that she was like, for a long time, she was very mixed in her popularity as a result of the song in the movie. Right. Do you think for years afterwards, boyfriends were like turning up on dates with like a pop of hose <laughs> in the back of the- <laughs> Don't worry, Alice. I got this. I saw the movie. I know what the lady likes. <laughs> the pump starts. Because it's quieter in the movie than those air hoses are, by the way. Right. You don't just hear the. <laughs> there's the bit. That- there's like the bellows. You know what I mean? Like the motor bellow. <laughs> oh, sorry. Is it killing the mood? It's like a Spanish guitar player in the back. <laughs> like, just lay there, Alice. I'll be right back. <laughs> Come on, prime it, prime it. All right. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Oh, I'm out of gas. I want to gas. All right, Alice, get in the car. I'm taking you to the most erotic experience of your life. Where are we going? The wind tunnel. <laughs> Got us suspended in the middle, naked in a harness. <laughs> Is it doing it for you, Alice? I don't know. I'm kind of into that. (laughs) (laughs) Sounds all right. (laughs) Um. (laughs) I feel like this actually leads to kind of an important moment of the film, right? Where (laughs) she she, she sleeps with Shelly. Um. And things keep going worse and worse and worse uh, with her and her and Ray. Then finally, she's like, "Fuck it, I'm out. Like, here's your damn church. I'm on vacation. Like, screw the restaurant. I'm out." It is funny though because it's one of those moments where you know they're having problems, but it's when he wants to go fishing while she's cooking. You swimming, know? yeah. Swimming. Sorry, not fishing. Yeah. And they go swimming, and she seems all right. But then when she, he wants to take Shelly, I don't know. 
I think she I think she might have felt more for Shelly than she let on, you know? Oh, absolutely. And uh I think it's very clear that she had fallen out of love with Ray at that point. Um Yeah. I don't think she gets back into love with Ray, even no. if they get married. No, I don't think so at all. Um, this is exactly what I meant, by the way, when I said the ending of the movie. I never saw a movie that started so bad and so well. The ending mm-hmm. of the movie is a fucking masterpiece. Yeah. That wedding uh, and that, that final scene, that's what, that to me, everything after... Okay, maybe I'm jumping ahead a little bit. I think Shelley's death is fucking dumb. I don't think it fits in the film. It's, it's a little of the time... Because you see this in a lot of movies that of around this time where it's like, we just had this character we just fucking killed off. Right. Um, they they want to really make weird. the movie about something suddenly. Mm-hmm. Or about more. They want to add this other thing the movie's about quickly. Right. And it sort of works. But everything after he dies is a really great film, I think. Mm-hmm. I want to see that movie. I want to see the movie that was more of that, I think. Because the wedding's great, I think. And the um, the funeral, the wedding, the the Alice stood on the steps. I think is excellent. Right. So uh, the scene I want to talk about is when Alice shows up at Arlo's apartment. Right. Um, you mean someone in this movie propositions him to Arlo and he says no because he's <laughs> so he's so cool. You see. He's, he's, so no. Okay. <laughs> to establish this is that clearly these two have had some sort of relationship before that. They they yes. mention it. She's. She's very, she fawns over Arlo quite a bit. Um, almost as like a, a, a very, uh, like an ex that they haven't quite got over yet. Right. Right. And you see that through the whole movie. She kind of really, really dotes on, on Arlo quite a bit. And, uh, so when she shows up at his apartment after breaking it off with, with Ray, She's there, and I think you actually get hints that Arlo wants to get with her as well throughout the movie, um, but but doesn't get raise around and stuff like that. Oh yeah, I mean he's clearly in love with her. Yeah, I think. Uh, uh, I, I so think that's this, kind of obvious. So in this moment, she shows up and she's clearly distraught and she's crying. She throws herself on the bed, and once again, I think this is where we get um, an indication at the time. Where her first response is like, well, do you have anything to smoke? No. No, I don't. I don't want to fuck. Except my massive dick. <laughs> right. Her next question is basically like, well, let's just have sex then. And the thing is, is like... <sighs> All right, revealing probably a little too much about me first. I've been in that moment. Right? I've... Me personally, I've been in that moment where it's like, we got nothing really else to do. So, like... Sex kind of seems like a way to pass the time. Right? But she's out of it. She, she's pretty distraught. Sex with John and crossword puzzles. They're sort of about the same. Yeah, I mean. <laughs> <laughs> What's eight letters? <laughs> What's eight letters across. Disappoints constantly. John's penis. <laughs> But uh, but he actually, he 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 rejects her. He says no. Um, even though in that moment they they they're both about to get what they want from each other. Uh, but the scenario is just not right. You know, it's going to be not good in the long run. And he has some foresight. He's like, nah, nah, I'm not doing that. And uh, and it kind of. What we get afterwards is the sort of decline of Alice. Um, because right afterwards, she she goes back with Ray. And then the thing with Shelly happens. And then she's real. And then Arlo's dad passes. And it all just kind of goes downhill. And then there's this brief moment of reprieve. Where Ray comes to her in a real heartfelt moment. He's like, hey, I've been, I've been fucking up. I know I've been messing up. Like, let's, let's, let's get it together. I'll be better. And let's just get remarried. Right? Where, you know, we had our little courthouse marriage. Let's have a, 
a proper wedding uh, with all our friends. And we have a church, so we just do it here. And at least the the the, um, the wedding scene. Which, by the way, if he's still around, if I ever get married, I want the person who officiated that wedding <laughs> to officiate my wedding. Because that was awesome. I thought you were going to say you wanted off the pen to do your wedding video. <laughs> Do you, know, do you know what we sort of feel a little bit sorry for? The real Alice. Right. Because they divorced before the movie came out, Alice and Ray. Mm-hmm. But it must be kind of weird to be like, okay, so I owned this restaurant, I knew this guy, this folk singer, right? And then he goes and he writes this song about a thing that sort of happened, and I'm in it. And that's interesting, right? Right. Then they go and make this movie about based on him, right? It's his movie. It's mm-hmm. the Arlo Guthrie movie based on him, and and based on the things he wrote in the song about us. And now my fucking shitty marriage is on <laughs> is on cinemas coast to coast. <clears throat> that must be uncomfortable, right? That must be unpleasant. Oh yeah. Um, I can't I, imagine. I'm, I'm. I don't know what their relationship is now, but I can't imagine they were friends just after this movie came out. <laughs> Alice Nalo Guthrie, right? You know. <clears throat> so the so there's another character that's in this movie. I think we should talk about real briefly. Okay. Um, I don't know if they ever mentioned her name in the movie, but in the credits she's listed as uh, Mari Chan. Oh, uh, Alo's love mm-hmm. at the end of the movie. Yeah, so, like, do I, okay, do I get this right? It's, it's at Thanksgiving when Alice, is, Alice points her out to him, right? Yes, I believe so. Okay. <laughs> She's so, only in the first half of the movie, and then she becomes a very big part through the second half, and you're a bit mm-hmm. like, okay, where did yeah. she come from? So, this <laughs> This is where I kind of get the the feeling. This is where a lot of my interpretation of like Arlo kind of just not being a person who fits in comes from. So what we get is this, there's this woman, uh, Mari Chan, who just she kind of shows up. She's one of the one of the hippies that shows up, and at this point, uh, Arlo has declined. Fourteen year old, the club owner. And Alice, right? Do I got do I got this? The yeah, yeah. He's declined all of them, and she's this this Mary Chan is just kind of in the in the distance. And I think even Alice makes a comment like, "Oh, she's just around." Mary right? Chan's the only one who said she definitely wasn't a cop. <laughs> right. And uh, so what we get is that Arlo Have- goes to jail. Have you considered the, the unfortunate pattern that maybe just all the others were too old? <laughs> Including the 14-year-old? Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Alo Guthrie. Um, but yeah, like, <laughs> it, it's actually one of my favorite, actually one of my favorite parts of the film is Officer Obi, after they clean up the garbage, he's like, okay, I'm going to escort you out of county. I don't care what the fuck you do afterwards. Just as long as you're out of the county. And Arlo goes, well, can I pr- pick up my chick first? Mm. <laughs> He's like, yeah, whatever. And uh, I'm not just, a monster. <laughs> he, he runs in his pottery class. He's like, He's like, come away with me. Let's go. And she's just like, well, I mean, am I going to be your girlfriend? And, and this is where I think is important, right? Because all, all the other characters who want to have sex with him just want to have sex with him. Right? In that moment. For whatever reasons, and usually selfish reasons, uh, you know, the fourteen-year-old is a groupie, so she just wants to, you know, notch up as many musicians as she can on her on her bedpost. Uh, the the club owner, you know, I, I think you can make the the case that she's getting up there in age and wants to have a little fling, you know, to make herself feel good. Uh, Alice is distraught <clears throat> and you know has no nothing else to do. And she wants that little bit of comfort. And Arlo 
says no to all of them. <clears throat> but when he gets to Mary Chan, he goes like, hey, let's go away. And she she stops and goes like, well, sure, but am I your girlfriend? Like, will we be together? And then he's on board. He's like, yes. And and I think I think that's kind of important for my my interpretation of him just not fitting in with the scene is <clears throat> he's not about the free love. He he wanted something more. Well, see, my my interpretation has never been that he doesn't fit it. Not that he doesn't fit in with the scene, or that they don't want to say that. My opinion is that that's ultimately not about the character of Arlo Guthrie who serves the film, and it's about making Arlo Guthrie the persona more um, of a uh, cool nonconformist nerd bad boy of folk music. I get, so here's the thing. There's another movie Arthur Penn directed, right? Mm-hmm. Universally reviled movie, right? Okay. And I think this and that are, despite the fact that they're very different movies, I think they're fundamentally the same sort of thing. Okay? I'm talking, of course, about the incredible movie <laughs> Penn and Teller Get Killed, right? <laughs> you ever seen Penn and Teller Get Killed? No. I know it, of it. It's an ad for Penn and Teller. It's a comedy movie. Penn and Teller star in it. And it, it's not a bad film. It's, okay, it's a pretty terrible movie, but the, the concept is not really atrocious, right? They're Penn and Teller. They're the same people they normally are. But they have this routine in the movie in which what they like to do is prank each other to make it look like they've been involved in horrific accidents, you know? It's mm-hmm. like Teller will pop out of a body bag or Penn will pretend to get his hand cut off. That's the relationship they have in the sort of cartoon version of them in the movie, right? As right. these wacky sort of pranksters. But then they accidentally incur the wrath of some hitmen who actually try to kill them, right? And okay. then the movie is sort of a road movie farce where they're pranking each other to make it look like they're injured and someone's actually trying to kill them. It's not a bad setup if you're going to make a Penn and Teller movie, right? You know what mm-hmm. I mean? To me, this movie is basically the same thing. Arlo Guthrie's a folk musician and he's part of the hippie movement sort of and the folk music revival. And this movie, even though there are times when it gets to somewhere that I think is much, much better, like the ending, Mm -hmm. fundamentally his role in this movie is to further the brand of who Arlo Guthrie is, the musician and the album. Okay, so would you have the same opinion had this movie been called Alice's Restaurant, right? And... <clears throat> the character's name was Arlo, but it wasn't played by Arlo Guthrie. Um, I don't know. I I genuinely don't know. If it was exactly the same movie in every way, but it wasn't played by Arlo Guthrie, I'd like to think I would, but I don't know. It doesn't help that, okay, no offense, Arlo Guthrie's not a great actor. No. <laughs> um, That definitely doesn't help, because how are you supposed to get fully immersed in the sincerity of someone who isn't a great actor. Um, I don't know. I, to me, I just feel like the, the dialogue is written at service of trying to sell you on a persona of Arlo Guthrie as the... Oh, sorry, my mic just fell down. Of uh, Arlo Guthrie as the... Uh, as the... I don't want to say perfect guy, right? But kind of almost. He's supposed to be, even if he doesn't fit in, he fits in in just the right way and he's rebellious or he doesn't fit in in school but he fits in in just the right way against the stuffy teachers or just the right way against the bullies of the long-haired hippies or just the right way in which he says no to the people he should say no to and says yes to the people he should say yes to not just in a case of finding what's right for him but in a case of i think the character is fundamentally and i don't like this expression because it's been used in a real misogynistic way, I think it's a Mary Sue Arlo Guthrie. That's how I feel about the Arlo Guthrie in this. In the same way that Penn and Teller in Penn and Teller Get Killed have their flaws. They're silly and they get themselves accidentally killed and they're doing all this immature childish stuff. But it's in service of a brand that is, hey look, Penn and Teller, they're these wacky comedy duos who get in adventures as the comedy duo Penn and Teller. You know, the Penn and Teller get killed isn't about their dabbles in libertarianism. You know what I mean? Right. And that's how I feel about Arlo Guthrie in this film. He is a, 
it might be true to Arlo Guthrie, and it might be true to what his life was or the role, and it might even have relevance to the overall 60s theme, but he as a character is perfect in just the right ways all the time. His flaws are perfectly mediated flaws, and his mm. things he agrees to are always just the right things he should. The only thing he does wrong in the whole movie, really meaningfully wrong, the only thing he does, the only things he does that are bad are in service to his brand. Like the the hilarious dumping incident that ends up getting him out of Vietnam, which is a true story, but do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. That's kind of how I feel about it. Um, and see, like, I, I, I'll say that I think his character in this movie is a trope. Like, I think, you know, it's not necessarily a, a unique character. Uh, I, I kind of feel like it's, it's almost prototypical of, like, uh, Zach Braff's character from Garden State, or, um, it's, it's that, that, and there's times where it can be super annoying. Like, don't get me wrong. Like, I think that this type of character can be used very, very poorly. But it's that, it's that character who just, like, doesn't, I don't want to say he doesn't fit in because I've been saying that a lot. But, like, it's kind of just floating through things. Well, okay. And- but imagine if the character of Zach Braff plays in Garden State was called Zach Braff and it was about Zach Braff's life. I guess. But... but, okay, could you give me an example in this movie of a flaw that Arlo has that you are not supposed to admire in him? Oh, I think his relationship with his father. I would... Um, okay, no, that's good. That's right. That, that I would agree. Mm-hmm. I'd agree with that. But that's such a small part of the movie, too. I guess that's the one thing that humanizes him in there. Everything else come, feels so flawed to it, you know? Well, because he, he does say it at a certain point to Mari-chan. Um, or he's like, I've, I've been doing... Like, I've, I've been doing what... How does he word this? He goes, I've been doing the things that they tell me I shouldn't be doing because I thought that's what I wanted to do. Um... Oh, he says it in a very specific way. It's kind of like a weird, like, roundabout way of saying it. Okay, but he um, hasn't been doing that. He says it, but what, what is he referring to? What is the thing he should be doing, shouldn't be doing, that he's doing? What, what's the thing he's doing that he's doing because other people tell him to in this film? Well, I mean, like, I think you look at the beginning of with him in college, and I think it even translates no, no, into... No, he went to college because he didn't want to go to Vietnam. Sure, but then if, he doesn't if, doesn't then the, doesn't work out there. Like okay, because sure, like the, the idea the ending, that he he should want to go to Vietnam because but if you know, the ending of the movie was that he went to Vietnam, that would work. Mm-hmm. But it doesn't. He doesn't go. He goes to college because he wants to get out of Vietnam, and that's where we find him at the beginning of the movie. So that decision doesn't take place in the movie, in my opinion. But fair enough. But mm-hmm. then he leaves college because. Oh, the stuffy professors. Oh, the annoying locals. Arlo's just so great. He's right. And he's right to leave. And then he visits... And the thing about... The problem with his, the scenes with the relationship with his dad, the scenes where his dad's in the hospital, they are so devoid of... I, like, I agree, that was kind of my read that he doesn't have a great relationship with his dad, but they also don't really say or do anything there beyond that, I guess. Uh, I mean, those are the bits well, that are I, interesting I, to me. I, I wouldn't say like, he has a bad relationship with his father. Like, I, I don't mean to say that. I think, the, when, I, when I say his relationship with his father, I think it's like the absence of right. a relationship with his father. Like, I think he doesn't, that's even, fair. he doesn't even call him dad. He, al- he always refers to him as Woody. Yeah, I know? think that's, and I think that's the most interesting bit, because it's ambiguous as well. Mm-hmm. It's neither ambiguously good nor bad, and that's, that's really good. Everything else he does in the movie, he's always in that role of, I just happened to make the perfect decision, but I'm still but the troubled I don't, outsider. I don't, I don't, I don't see that. I don't see the idea that I made the perfect decision. I, I, I continually see it through the that he's had like one foot in, one foot out in everything. Right? It's like, okay, yes, his reasons for going to college is to get away from the war, right? But he's there. He got in. 
but he doesn't quite stay, right? He always has one foot out, right? Because he's like, ah, I'm just not, not digging it. I'm not into it, right? Um, even, even with all the, the people who are more or less his peers, you know, he never stays at the church, right? He never stays and hangs out for longer than a day, usually. And it's, and even though he, they implore him multiple times, like, just stay, man. Just like, stay here. Like, it'd be great. He's not there. And then at the end, what you get is this moment where, uh, I mean, this is kind of the big climax is Ray goes on this big rant about how it's going to be so much better because he's going to sell the church and they're going to buy a parcel of land and everyone can hang out there. He wants to start a commune essentially. And he's going on and he's like, come on, Arlo, let's, let's do it. And Arlo's like, nah. And he leaves. He, him and Mari Chan just take off. And I, it, to me, to me, it's, it, so little about this movie is about him necessarily rebelling against anything, but more or less just trying to figure out what he wants to do and, and basically knocking it off the list of the things he doesn't. And I hate to say it, but I think you're seeing something in this film that isn't there. I, I mean, think I this agree is a, with you. <laughs> I think this is a much, a much, I think this is a much simpler film than that when it's about Arlo, really. I think and, and the, I, take, I, the take on this film's character is really not that much more complicated than this is the image of rebellious counterculture folk singer let's make him within that framework a cool version of that archetype and i don't think it plays i think you're getting too wrapped up on the idea that it is arlo guthrie like i i think that's kind of a stopping point and it's it's a it's a thing that needs to be like pushed beyond like the 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 fact that, like, yes, it's played by Arlo Guthrie and the character's name is Arlo Guthrie. Yes, I, you know, sure. That means this will be a depiction of a real person. But after that, like, I don't see that any of the stuff in this movie is designed to push a image of him at all. Like, it well, just seems like... maybe push is the wrong word. It's just that everything is in service of that single toned representative of him. I don't think there's a character here, really, meaningfully. And I don't mean in the sense of, like, he doesn't do very much. I think it's a... Um, I think it's a brand in an otherwise interesting movie. Walking around being a brand. Um, and, I mean, this is not unusual. You see a ton of movies like this from this time. But, um, but it, to me, it's... If you consider the kind of music Arlo Guthrie makes, right? And, and folk music and what it's about and what the image of the community is. I think what you're looking at here is just the folk music equivalent of an Elvis movie. I mean, I, I would agree if it wasn't for the case that everything else that he's tied to is kind of bad. You know, like, he's not the only, like, folk singer or hippie in the movie he's sure he's part of like a community of them and they're all kind of shitty sure <laughs> and but so that idea that, of like he's not shitty that's the, the that's the flaw in the movie that's the fundamental flaw in the movie it's a movie that's all about how hippie culture isn't as great as everybody wants it to seem and that there's there's something that is limiting about a life where you try to just break down all that concept of commitment and because it is an anti-hippie movie i think even though it's about hippies i think it's not a movie made by hippies does that make sense yeah i mean i i, I get what you're saying i think it's, it's critical of of the hippie movement in a lot of ways sure i agree and, and, and to me, I, I feel like it. arlo's character in this movie is the vehicle where we get that criticism not that he uh, him as arlo guthrie the real person is necessarily critical. They use him as the vehicle to be critical. Yeah, I think that's fair, but they use the, him as the vehicle to be critical by making him uh, unlikably, uncritically viewed. 
I think. I, I think this is a movie about something most of the time. And yet, then you've got in the movie Arlo Guthrie, who is a character who is about nothing except there is an entity called Arlo Guthrie and he's the one who's got it right. And that it doesn't work for me. And I, I guess I just don't see it as a case of like it being him getting it right. It's just him having a different view on it. That just happens to always be the right one. Like I said, I don't think it's a matter of right or wrong. Oh, I think it expl- Oh, I absolutely think it is. Absolutely. I think, so for example, I think the scene with the, the groupie, it's an alright scene. Uh, and the idea that he wouldn't sleep with a 14-year-old and he recognizes this is wrong is intended to be, you know, it's a moral choice in keeping with that character. But that's all the character exists to do, really. The, it, it's not that he's the passive observer like that. If he was the passive observer, um, it would work. But he's not. He is the observer who also makes the better choices than everyone else. And I think the film explicitly wants you to think Arlo's choices are better than everybody else's. He's right to, you know, make an issue with the stuffy lecturer. He's right to fight off the people bullying him for his long hair. And sometimes he is wrong. I'm not saying he's wrong. I'm saying that every scene in the movie is chosen to advance the view that Arlo Guthrie always makes the right choices in these situations where people around him are making wrong choices. Well, I mean, we go back to that scene with, with the groupie. I think maybe the more important part of that scene isn't necessarily his decision. It's the information that she relays to him. When she lists the other people that she slept with, it's kind of a revelation sure. of, of like, that's oh, because shit, everything this is going on. That's because everything happening around Arlo Guthrie is a more interesting film. But his role in that film, the, his role, that character, his role in that scene is to make the right choice while other people made wrong ones. And that's all the character does. Through, for the entire film, his role is to... Yes, you, I agree that he is the, the tool through which we criticize, we see a critical perspective on the world around him. But the way that is done in the film, I think, is poor. Which is by having a character that just so happens to be the guy who wrote the song who made it and is the star and is the, uh, the, the actual actor playing himself always put in a position where he is always making the correct choices while other people made the wrong. Or he's always making the, the admirable choices or the enjoyable choices. Or the, he never makes choices that have negative consequences for people. He never makes choices that have negative consequences for himself. He never makes choices that have... And he's not a passive observer because he's not a character who doesn't make choices that influence the plot. He's just a character who always makes the choices that advance the view fundamentally that Arlo Guthrie may be an outsider, but the outside is the right place to be. Okay, so... I think, okay, here, here's the compromise I'm willing to make on this. No compromise! Okay. I will no, accept okay. full agreement or the show is cancelled! Fair enough, we had three episodes. <laughs> Hope you enjoyed it! <laughs> no, go for it. Sorry, I've talked for a little bit. That's... No, the thing I is, I'm, probably, I'm, I'm still formulating exactly how I feel as I'm explaining it, you know what I mean? No, like I, all these I, I, will, I will say that I think that there is some technical flaws with his character um, in, in terms of, of the movie-making process. Not necessarily intent or a depiction, but straight up just flaws in like the writing process. Right? Of... Um, the, the few times that we get to him to make a decision, you know, are kind of limited, right? There's like so much of the movie is just not about him. Right. Right. And, and the few times where he is put in a position where he makes a decision. Yeah. It just so happens that maybe it's, it's, um, I mean, not, I mean, I will say that I think the groupie, uh, decision is, uh, objectively a good or bad decision of what he does there. Sure. Um, 
But I think all the other decisions he makes aren't necessarily uh, black and white decisions, right? They're not necessarily even supposed to be uh, observed as like, oh, a right decision or a bad decision. It's just a decision that happens. I I completely disagree. I think you are. And I'm going to keep talking. And uh, what we get is at the end of the film, we have a whole lot of other things going on. Right, you have the the Shelley plot, and you have the Alice and Ray plot, and which takes up far more um, time in the film than Arlo's decisions. Right, sure. Which is why I think we well, at the end of this film, what we get is just a section of time um, that plays out where Arlo is kind of an ancillary character to the whole thing, right, and. His involvement with some of these situations, like the, the scene with Alice, um, e- even the the garbage uh, scene, uh, aren't necessarily supposed to be like fundamental to the plot. It's there. There are no, things that happened. Like, like I said, like I don't like th- this movie doesn't feel like it has a plot. It looks almost just like a observation of a time of life, right? And it, these are just things that sort of happened during this process. But then for everything else in the movie, he could just not be there. And the movie goes on without it. So it's like, if anything, if any, if any sort of image is being pushed of Arlo, it's just of one of unnecessary, right? It just it doesn't even have to be there. And this movie still happens. This, all these events but that, but that, still happen. But for but the, that we're talking about else. plot function. And that's not what I'm talking about, necessarily. Um, I, no, I, I agree he doesn't advance the plot. But if he doesn't advance the plot, I think he would work better as a less... Uh, I don't know. See, the problem is we've got a fundamental different reading of the character. And we're not going to resolve that. Right. Um, but no. No, I, 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 I don't see that character the way you see it at all. Because you're wrong. No, it's yeah. It, I mean, it is what it is. We, we're we, we're we're going to disagree on things. We've done it forever. Um, I mean, it would be a boring show if we agreed on everything. <laughs> Welcome to the agreement show. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, I didn't like this film. Okay, so should we go on to the last the last? Well, we class. don't have anything to call it anymore because we changed the name of the show. So I'm just going to say yeah. it. Um, I don't think it's a great film. I think it. I think there are times when it hits the point of being about something, and I think actually to go back to our disagreement, fundamentally, I watched this movie and I didn't think it was about something often enough. Um, and I think my problem with the film fundamentally is when it's about something, it's interesting. Most of the time, it's not really about anything. Uh, it's actually, I think it's quite a self-indulgent film that just wants to put shit on the screen quite often. Uh-huh. Um, and the difficulty is, yes, I agree with you that it's a, it's a movie that's sort of about trying to capture a group of people and a time and a place. And I, my final thought is the Arlo Guthrie character doesn't really help further that goal it's actually quite distracting and that the section of the movie that is adapted from the song alice's restaurant is the most interesting bit but doesn't actually fit into the main film that well and i think if arthur penn had made a film that was supposed to be about those people in that town and about the people person alice and the restaurant alice's restaurant and wasn't actually trying to make an adaptation of the song alice's restaurant this might actually be a great movie because you can see, th- there's two films, right? There's the there's the Arlo Guthrie movie that's about that's based on the song, and there's the movie that's about those people and that couple living in that church, right? Mm-hmm. And that second movie is an amazing film that has been obscured by the fact that it's got to be about the song. I think that's my final opinion. Go, you right. can have it. I won't interrupt you to the end until you're done. Oh my god, that's. My heart swells. I'm not going to be interrupted. 
All right, um, ran it on Dairy Boy. <laughs> uh, you, you know, as, as much as I, I, I maybe have come off as defending the film throughout the the show, uh, it's not one of my favorites. <laughs> I don't, I don't think I'd ever really sit down and watch it again. I, I think what's interesting about it, uh, is, is more or less academic at this point. Uh, like I mentioned at the beginning of the, the, of the movie or the, the show, excuse me, uh, th- how this fits in with the time period and the things that are going on in the cinema world, uh, when this is coming out, I think are very interesting. And I think we're getting a lot of, uh, early examples, at least on the American side of things of like, we're going to, we're going to go out, we're going to film stuff, we're going to throw it together, we're going to put it out there, we're going to defy expectations, we're going to um, really challenge the status quo of what it means to make a movie. And for those aspects, I can appreciate it. Um, I think it's an uh, important film in history, even if it's not necessarily remembered well. Um as opposed to some other movies within within the new uh the French New Wave movement, <clears throat> I think it has a place among it. And for the, in that regard, I I appreciate the film. Uh from a purely entertainment standpoint and enjoyment, uh, not really. Um just <laughs> not my thing. I think there's I think there's other I think there's other movies that address uh some of these issues uh better. It also hasn't aged well. What happened to not not interrupting? Oh, I thought you were done. I'm sorry. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> I thought that was the uh, end I, I, of I the think there's, I think there's movies out there uh, like uh, Easy Rider, which are it was a better yes um, depiction of this sort of thing. Uh, in a sense, Hair is is kind of a better better look at this. Um, less um, less even, literally. Even the, Sorry, less literally, but Bonnie and Clyde. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, even the documentary about Woodstock uh, is actually a pretty good yeah. examination of this of this time period um, and these movements, these these very movements that are going on in the world and the, the, the positive and negatives of them. Uh, now... The thing is, I am an Arlo Guthrie fan. <laughs> I like his music. Uh, I love I love the song. I like a lot of his other music. I think he's actually a very, very good musician who, unfortunately, maybe have been saddled by a very popular song. And uh, that, that's too bad. But I still like the song. And I like Arlo Guthrie. So, in the end, not my, not my favorite film of all time. But uh, it's a movie I can appreciate. I um I liked the song like a thousand percent more than the film. Well, yeah, <laughs> I will agree. It's just not a very good movie. It, it it is about more than you think when you start watching it, but it's about much less than it wants to be about. I think. Yeah. Um. So here's a thing I thought, and I I want to know how you feel about this because it might be messing with our mandate, but. Mm-hmm. Just as a little a little idea, how about we add to the roster of shows to do, of things to do on the show? We do Penn and Teller Get Killed, which was Arthur Penn's final cinematic movie. To show you what 20 years will do to a career. <laughs> oh. Would we consider that an adaptation? Of what? Penn and Teller, the human beings. <laughs> All right, maybe we'll say We'll talk that. about it. We'll talk about it. When, when we set up a Patreon, that'll be our, our Patreon special episode. Sure. Uh, so what are we going to do next week? Have we decided? Well, it's definitely going to be a comic. Uh, we've thrown around a, a few ideas, um, but we haven't landed on one fully. Well, let's say what? Let's do this on the show. I'm pulling up the movies based on comics Wikipedia page. We'll take a look. Are we going for a superhero comic or are we going for something a little bit more obscure? You know, I was actually kind of thinking that more obscure might be fun. Okay. Well, let's see. Alien vs. Predator Requiem. That's not based on... Is that based on a comic? I guess oh, yeah, they're, they're considering they're... Alien vs. Predator to be a comic. Mm-hmm. So I, I actually have a suggestion. Okay. 
hit me with but it. And I'll keep it's going to be a little off, and it might require. I think it would, it would require us definitely having to track down both um, s- uh, sources. Okay. But there's a movie that came out in 2013 called Blue is the Warmest Color. I've never even heard of this. Yep, and it is based on a comic book. Uh, it's a French film, but it is based on a comic book. Let's see. Look it up. Blue is the Warmest Color. 2013 French romance film, co-written, co-produced, and directed by Abdelaf Kashish. Based on the graphic novel of the same name. I have never even heard of this. But I, I, can't, cause I came across that list, too. I looked up a list of uh, movies <laughs> off, based on comic books that you didn't realize. Okay. So we're doing, a, we're doing a foreign film as well. Yep. Our first foreign. All right, we'll do that. Let's do it. Okay. Blue is the warmest color, which is objectively wrong in color theory. <laughs> One point against it already. <laughs> it's, it's the song One is the Loneliest Number all over again. <laughs> Because it even specifically says in the song that uh, zero is as bad as one, right? So clearly <laughs> one is not the loneliest number. It's co-lonely with At zero. At least as lonely. Yeah. <laughs> There's an old Lionel Hutz quote in, uh, in The Simpsons where he says, uh, Mr. Simpson, this is the greatest case of false advertising since my lawsuit against the movie, The Never-Ending Story. <laughs> <clears throat> All right, well, we're going to get out of here, I think. It's a good time to wrap up. That's our first big disagree episode, I think. Disagree is not a word. Uh, In other news, you can find me by going to my YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash Owen Adams. You can find John by going to, where can they find you, John? You can find me on Twitter, which is at John C. Person. You can, uh, well, continue watching this channel. This is where I put most of my content. And I also have a Twitch channel, which is twitch.tv forward slash jcrizzle12. That's where you can find me. And then uh, below, there should be links to our Discord, which will, uh, by the time this episode airs, we'll have a little subcategory for Adept Nation, where we will post anything and everything related to this show there, and you can chime in there. It'll be fun. And um, um, we'll be back in two weeks mm-hmm. with Blue is the Warmest Color. Yep. Which, according to the Wikipedia page, uh, was controversial for its film's raw depiction of sexuality. John, you Ooh. old dog, you. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to see some boobies. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking better now. We better get free <laughs> epic for this, if not. Um, all right. You guys are all awesome. Thank you very much for watching. I hope you had a good time. I'm going to plug in my headset again because I can't hear a damn thing. Bye, guys. Have a good one.